I really got going on it when I was in the south of France uh, with the picture postcards, those rather outrageous picture postcards of all colours of the coast, you know, and I found that by using them in certain ways you could get really extraordinary sort of metamorphosis out of these cards, like that one, for instance, uh, which I think is in the Tate, uh, where the Eiffel Tower becomes the backbone of a, a creature that is flying. And uh, so the, the, that is really a case of metamorphosis, that the, the Eiffel Tower should, should be made to do that. Was there ever one occasion in particular when you, you took a certain pleasure in uh, defying the public? Just after the war had begun, uh, the Royal Academy sent out invitations to, I think, almost every artist they could think of, to send in pictures to a great uh, exhibition, Artists Against Fascism, I think it was called. And I sent in two pictures. One was a collage, which uh, uh, no objection was raised to that. Uh, but the other picture was a sort of abstract form um, over which I had written the description of an imaginary person. And uh, th there were words in it which uh, they didn't like, and I got a letter from the Royal Academy saying, would I p please remove this picture and send another picture, if possible, without writing, they said. And uh, so, what I did was to go downtown and get a card, which uh, in deaf and dumb language, I chose a four-letter word, S-H-I-T, and uh, did it up as, as hands saying this, I like that. And they accepted that at once. In fact, they uh, hung it exactly opposite an enormous portrait of His Majesty the King. It must be mad to have the true image of what the time is. Yeah, that uh, sounds a very dangerous uh, no, parallel. Dangerous. Everything is Doesn't dangerous. It? Uh, because if uh, art is to be uh, 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 mad as the politicians are mad... No, 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 we are mad in a very different way. Yes, oh. I suppose exactly that, the opposite. that is the great the opposite difference, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. To one madness we oppose another madness. Yes, <coughs> yes. And Max Ernst was your introduction to the Surrealist group. Yes. They were mostly a very vigorous, boisterous, group of young people who were uh, very excited about the, the, the new ideas. I got to know the, some of the younger ones first, who were some of the, the wildest, and who were always surrounded by extraordinarily lively and pretty girls. And uh, so my life from the seclusion, the cloistered seclusion of Cambridge, began to change rather rapidly. At what time, Roland, did you um, know Picasso? It really began in 1935. I'd been fairly close to him, but without ever getting to know him before that. But it was simply one day I was in Paris, and I'd seen in the Calle d'Art a reproduction of a picture which absolutely fascinated me. It seemed to me to speak a new magic language, and I very much wanted to see it, and if possible, buy it. And Picasso said, well, if you want to buy the picture, you better see it first. It's at Boisgelou. And uh, he summoned the car immediately, the old Hispano, and we all piled into it. And off we went at high speed and got to Boisgelou. And out of a long row of pictures, Picasso immediately picked out this wonderful little picture. And that was the beginning of a relationship, was it? All the other people I met, such as... Um, Herbert Reed, Henry Moore, Humphrey Jennings, Paul Nash, when I got back to England. When the pictures arrived, started arriving even from Paris and were, were unpacked, everybody who saw them was absolutely astonished, bringing something from abroad which London was, had been not been conscious of until that time. It was just a shot in the dark, and it was marvellous how it paid. Surrealism became a cause to me, almost. Back to barbarism. How did you meet your, your second wife, Lee? Ah, well, that was in Paris. Uh, it was at a fancy dress ball organized by the Surrealists among these very elegant people in, in very fancy costumes. And there was one girl who wasn't dressed up at all. She just had a long evening dress on. And um, that was Lee Miller, who I met for the first time that evening and who I married some little while after. Can you tell me how Lee first struck you that first night? It was very beautiful. Very enticing and very beautiful. 
she was blonde, uh, fairly tall, and with an extraordinarily pretty profile, uh, and a great deal of character. I think those were the things. Uh, intelligence and character, as well as beauty, are things I've always found dominating in women. You'll always meet headline personalities when you drop into the celebrity room with Ona Munson. So let's do a little eavesdropping as she chats with this evening's special guests. You know, Lee, I'm afraid the bellhop didn't believe me when I said you were a real live lady war correspondent. That isn't the first time I run into skepticism, Ona. <laughs> I know that anyone who has ever seen a Lee Miller picture or article in Vogue magazine must want to know a lot about you, Lee. Well, far away, Ona. I'll try real hard to sound like a fabulous character. Well, that would just be typecasting. First, I think we'd better clear up just how you happen to be a photographer in the first place. I don't know how other photographers go about it, but I thought the best way was to start out studying with one of the great masters in the field, Man Ray. Well, I'm sure that studying with a great photographer like Man Ray was invaluable training. It was, Ona. And when I began actually working on my own and on Vogue magazine, I realized how invaluable it was. So you became Vogue's war correspondent. Well, most correspondents were assigned to cover one army, and they moved as that army moved and reported those maneuvers. But since Vogue only had one war correspondent, Lee Miller, I got to rattle around all over the place. <laughs> well, Lee, wasn't there some ruling about women not being allowed where there was fighting? Sure there was. And for a while, it looked like I was going to be court-martialed for being where I wasn't supposed to be. You see, I went in the day they took Munich. I've been carrying Hitler's Munich address around in my pocket for years, and finally, I had a chance to use it. So you went calling? Yes, but mine host wasn't home. However, he had so recently been there that his private telephone wires were still operating, and one of the soldiers picked up the phone. I took some pictures of the place, and I also got a good night's sleep in Hitler's bed. And I even washed the dirt of Dachau off in his own tub. That was, in fact, the time when you wrote The, the Road is Wider Than Long. Why did you write it? It was written and the photographs taken during a wonderful trip that I did with Lee across um, the, the, the Balkans from Athens to Bucharest. And it turned out to, as a sort of visual poem. So it was a kind of celebration of your relation, new relationship with her, was it? Oh, yes. Her presence was there all the time. I couldn't uh, get out of writing about her. We'd settled in Sussex and at the same time travelled a lot. And I went back to painting, which I'd always wanted to do. But my painting became very uh, interfered with by other things I wanted to do as well. One was uh, trying to f continue the excitement that has begun in the 1936 exhibition. And we founded, little by little, what became known as the ICA, Institute of Contemporary Arts which of course in some ways was based on the Museum of Modern Art in New York and also on the CRS used to meet together and exchange their ideas. 